Good evening. Welcome to the September 14th Northampton School Committee meeting. I'm Mayor Gina Louise Shara, the chair of the committee, and I will be presiding this evening. This meeting is being held both remotely on Zoom pursuant to the modification of the state's open meeting law for the pandemic and in person here in the community room at JFK Middle School. This meeting and all participating will be audio and video recorded. I will begin by asking the clerk to please call the roll of the school committee. Mayor Shara. Present. Member Robbins. Present. Member Gazy. Member Gazy. Can they still not hear? She's here. No, can they not? Her Zoom isn't on right now. Hmm. She was here. She must have popped off. Okay. Oh. I'll, I'll, I'll look for her after. Uh, Member Seraphie Cox. Present. Member Stein. I don't think he's here. Member Levy. <clears throat> I didn't see her either. Member Miller. Present. Member Goldman. Present. Member Agna. Present. And Member Davis. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you. So it's Member Goldman and um, we believe Member Gazy. Um, and here's Member Davis. Um, will oh member davis is there. there's member Gage. so the people that are participating over zoom are member goldman and member gazy and was there a third person and member sarfi cox pardon me okay those folks are participating <coughs> remotely over zoom um we're going to take public comment in person and over zoom there is a sign up sheet for public comment in the community room um and for those on zoom if you wish to make a comment please use the raised hand feature in the bottom of your memory mem uh, memu bar under reactions if you're calling in by phone you can raise your hand by hitting star nine um so i am looking uh annie there's no no one signed up over there right now um there's no one here in the community room signed up for public comment and i'm looking but i do not see any hands so if there is no public comment, then we will move on to announcements. Okay, seeing no public comment, announcements. Um, I see member Sarafi Cox, we'll go to her and then we'll see if there are any other announcements. Hello. Hi, um, this isn't an announcement per se, but um, I uh, received a request from NACE about Potentially the session up in the agenda since educators need to be in school early. So um, obviously that's at the discretion of the chair, but wanted to communicate that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's see if there are other announcements and I will see what we can do. Any member Agna? I just wanted to wish everyone who's celebrating Rosh Hashanah in the next like, tomorrow, I guess, sundown. Um, we we wish you the best of New Year's and peaceful times. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, any other announcements? Okay. Seeing none, we can move on to the consent agenda. I'm going to read all the items on the consent agenda, and then I'm going to ask if there are any removals for discussion, because there's no discussion on the consent agenda. <coughs> so these are meeting uh, minutes for approval, August 10th, 23, school committee, January 10th, 23, school committee uh, meeting for the superintendent search, February 25th, 21, um, budget meeting, March 6th, 23, budget meeting, March 25th, 21, school committee meeting, um, and April 7th, 2020, April 8th, 2021, April 11th, 2019, <coughs> April 13th, 2023, those are all student advisory council meetings. Then April 25th, 2019, school committee meeting. May 11th, 23, student advisory. May 12th, 22, student advisory. September 22nd, 22, school committee meeting. October 13th, um, 22, December 9th, 21, and December 12th, 2019, those are all student advisory council meetings. And then these are minutes that were reviewed by the school committee, by members of the school committee. They, um, they are November 27, 2018, 
uh, school committee MCAS meeting, February 28th, 2019, special school committee budget meeting, March 28th, 2019, school committee budget meeting, March, I'm uh, sorry, May 11th, 23, school committee meeting, May 23rd, 19, special school committee meeting, August 13th, 2019, uh, school committee meeting September 26, 2019, special school committee meeting October 24, 2019, special school committee meeting June 30th, 2020, special meeting uh, October 20th, 2020, special meeting and October 14th, 2021. That's a regular school committee meeting. And then the only other item on the consent agenda is donations and there's a request to fundraise for the imagined words mural for JFK with the goal being $15,000. Those are the items on Tomorrow. the Thank consent you. agenda. Um, is there, are there any requests for removals? If not, yes. Can I ask about the ones that aren't linked to a live document? Yes. So I don't have an answer for you. So we. Can we remove those? I oh. yeah. Uh, I was going to say that um, one of the ones that's not linked is a one that I did, and it's because I hadn't finished it yet. Okay. Um, there were some things that I needed to check on the video, so I would support removing those. Apologies for not getting it done all the way. I don't know about the other two though. I just know the May twenty third, two thousand nineteen. Okay, so it looks like March twenty eighth. 19 March 23rd 19 June 30th 2020 all don't have hyperlinks so uh, there's a request to remove those um, any other requests yes Amber Miller. unfortunately because I didn't send them in earlier um, I have made note of a few corrections in a number of the documents and they're more like spelling errors or Scrivener's last errors. name omitted or something. Mm -hmm. And um, I could even, uh, how would you want me to offer those? Um, well, if we're gonna have a motion on the consent agenda, we could ask for a motion um, to approve with correcting Scrivener's errors. Um, so we can solve that problem with that. Are there any other, um, I, so ev the, the members who had made amendments, everyone's fine with what they've reviewed and amended. Yes. Otherwise. Okay. So if that's the case, would someone like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with March 28th, 19, May 23rd, 19 removed and June 30th, 2020 removed and with any uh, Scrivener's errors that have been noted by school committee members to be corrected. So moved. Second. Motion's been made by member Agnes, seconded by member Stein. Okay. And that includes the donation. That includes the donation. That's the entire consent agenda. Great. Okay. Roll call, please. Member Robbins? Yes. Uh, member Gazy. Do we, do we have member Gazy back yet? Yes. Back. She yep. might not be able to unmute though. Member Gazy, can you unmute? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think I can. Okay. Thank you. Is that me right there? Is that a yes vote? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Stein? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Miller? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Agna? Yes. Member Davis? Yes. And Mayor Shara? Yes. Okay, the consent agenda passes and we can move on to new business. So we have, um, so items A through D are recommendations to ratify MOAs. Um, e is, has been, is being removed from this agenda because it's not ready yet. Um, so we can take A through D individually, unless someone would like to move them as a group. So motion's been made to take A through D. So it's recommendation to ratify the school psychologist extension MOA, recommendation to ratify the unit G salary schedule change MOA, recommendation to ratify mentor coordinator change from hourly to stipend of $3,500 MOA, and recommendation to ratify unit A nurse's ability to take on duties of the school health director MOA. 
Uh, motion's been made by Member Robbins to take those as a group. Is there a second? Second it. Motion's been seconded by Member Agna. Thank you. Member Serafie Cox says. Okay. Member Serafie Cox. Discussion. Yes. Yeah, so the, um, the question that I had, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's uh, at a, on a later item. Uh, disregard. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion on A through D? Yes. Well, uh, just to clarify, the number of corrections that I have are on are the, meeting, uh, the minutes for approval tonight, not the ones school committee already reviewed. Excellent. That, those were in the consent agenda anyway, so it still counts. Okay. Good to go. Okay. Any further discussion on A through D, these MOAs? Seeing none, roll call, please. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Seraphy Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Shara. Yes. And Member Robbins. Yep. Okay, those pass. And that brings us down to F. A recommendation to restore the Director of Digital Literacy to full time. And Dr. Bonner. Okay. Would you like to? All right. If I could just give you some background of why we're making this request. This was one of the positions that was re reduced during the, the budget uh, negotiations of last spring. And uh, we are finding that there are multiple gaps mm -hmm. without having this position in place. So we're requesting the restoration of this position to full time. The absence of this position has put a hardship on the district in providing technical assistance, monitoring our website, um, even in terms of managing frontline for professional growth and working with the admin team. So this year we implemented several new programs that require technical assistance, uh, one being Parent Square, which you are all pretty much familiar with now. Um, pretty soon we will be launching Open Architect, which does our dashboards for our data and accountability. The SNAP program, which holds or houses our medical records. Uh, the M class, which is a new assessment for our elementary grades, as well as the iReady, which is K through, uh, which is grades uh, six through eight. So um, we really need this person, this person's uh, position, or I should say this position is very key to some of the work that we are doing now. As we continue in the age of technology and AI, it's important that uh, Northampton Public Schools remains uh, a, a credible player in those changes. And you know, we think about the creativity and the innovation in which our uh, instructors employ in the classroom. It will help in terms of um, having someone who is techno uh, technically savvy to help our teachers and our, and our uh, administrators. Um, you know, we may look to hybrid or virtual classes in the future. Who knows what the future may bring? And then it also accelerates our student learning. We use a lot of uh, tech, um, technology platforms and software programs to help with our uh, special needs uh, children. And so it just expands opportunities also for differentiation. So we're hoping that you will reconsider that. And then also another piece that happened to us this summer, which I don't think anyone was planning, the uh, chief IT director for the city slash school side, uh, that position is vacant, is now currently filled by an acting person. So we're really, um, um, really hurting for someone to lift or take some of the onus of some of these things that uh, we need in place for our school system. So I'm hoping that you will reconsider. Uh, working with Antonio before he left and Bobby, um, they have looked at the budget and, um, and uh, where we can actually uh, fund this position full time. Uh, and it's really from cost savings from our new hires as well as, you know, the, the last three months we've saved in terms of not having this person in position. However, we have paid for some stipends for people to cover some of those tasks. 
Um, so I'm hoping that you will consider that, and I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> I'm Member Levy. Thank you for the um, comprehensive explanation as well as where the funds were going to come from, because that would have been my question. Um, I will speak for myself, but I imagine I represent uh, the views of a number of my colleagues on the school committee that I don't think any of us wanted to cut any positions. And so if there's funding to bring this position back, I would fully support it. So I appreciate your advocacy. Member Stein. Um, yeah, I mean, I share uh, Member Levy's um, you know, being in favor of restoring. I guess my question is really on the budgetary piece. You know, when we did a lot of difficult decisions last year on the recommendations of the interim superintendent and the um, all committee, um, <coughs> this is one of the places they wanted to save money. And I guess I'm wondering what is the actual, like what's the cost breakdown here? So we, we cut it down to a half time or some partial time. We paid out tuition. So how much money are we talking about? And by adding it back in, we've sort of added, a, restored a line item that we will likely have to cut somewhere else from in the spring. So I want us to be cognizant of the fact that when we vote for this, we're restoring it, and we're making a choice that we're not going to spend tailings or other money that's been uncommitted because things haven't gone as we planned in the budget to other things. So it's it's not like it's, there's not a cost to something else. I think it's worth doing. I just want to know what the figures are and for folks to realize that essentially we're going to go into next season having added half a position when we start discussing the budget again. So just to keep it in mind. But so what are the figures that we're talking about? So in the operating budget, and Bobby, you can um, correct me on this, I believe what was set aside was fifty six or $57,000. That salary was literally cut in half. So... Um, we're looking at, this is a 12 month position. And so I believe the person who was in the position prior, that salary was about 107, maybe 116,000. Uh, Bobby, if you could speak to that, and I did see you on Zoom. There you are. Okay. Yeah, no, you're right on. Um, her salary, the retiring one, not the retiring one, but the one who resigned would have been, I believe, around um, 108 for fiscal 24. We reduced that to um, 54, and um, I believe the position is looking at 100 grand. So it would be a little under 100, I mean, a little under 50 grand to um, support that position at full time for this current year. And what do we pay in stipends to people already? I don't have the total in front of me. It's not massive. Um, I can get it for sure, but um, yeah, it's not. It's not massive. We didn't pay. We didn't pay out a ton. other discussion so are you what are you looking for from us so just approval to restore it to full time okay. um, and I'm bringing that to you because I know that that was a very difficult conversation that you all had during the budget season in terms of what to reduce um, but we have to really, as Michael pointed out, be cognizant, yes, that this will now be a line item in our uh, next year's budget, but it's worth having this position. Um, you know, we are in the 21st century. It is really pivotal that we have someone with the expertise that can help guide us with that technology. Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, Maybe it's putting the cart before the horse, but do we know that the person who's in the position now would be able to step in to the full time? Oh, so currently, the way that the position was posted when the former person resigned, uh -huh. it was posted as a uh, part-time position with the potential to go full-time. Uh -huh. So before the... Um, <clears throat> 
IT director um, left. He had the opportunity to interview some people. He left a candidate's name with me. Um, so I have not really, I've had a conversation, but I said we can have a deeper conversation after I go to the school committee to see if I can restore this as full time. I see. Yeah. I said one more financial question for Bobby. Okay. Um, or, or you, Dr. Bonner, which is, um, can you remind me how we're paying back the 1.2 million deficit? Like, are we relying on any of the, like the back to the school choice account? Like, are we using savings from the operating budget to do that? Or is that coming from another line? I, like, how, how are we filling that hole? So, so the things that we had to make up, the only thing we are using is um, 400,000 in ESSER funds. Um, and the rest, we had been given the 1.2 from the um, mayor. And that's it. So we're not using any tailings or anything like that um, for the support of the budget. I, th I thought we had like closer to 2.4, but you're saying it's only 1.6 total? that we were underwater? So it's like if it's 400 for masters, okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Member Levy. I move to restore the Director of Digital Literacy to full time. I second it. Motion's made by Member Levy, seconded by Member Agna. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call please. <coughs> Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Shara. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. That was the final. That passes. That brings us to G, vote to appoint an official delegate to vote for bylaws at the MASC conference on November 8th, 2023. Uh, okay, uh, so very quickly, in order for the school committee to have a vote at the annual business uh, meeting of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, that's MASC, it's necessary that an official delegate be designed uh, and uh, be uh, selected by the school committee to represent this body. And um, I do know that uh, Gwen Agna is registered to attend that meeting. So um, the question, well, the request is that if you would uh, give her authorization to make, uh, to actually vote during the annual business session that will be held in November. <laughs> I'll make a motion to um, elect uh, our vice chair, Ms. Agna, to uh, be our representative and vote at the MAP conference. Okay, motion's been made by Member Miller. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Member Levy. Uh, Member Serafi Cox. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify on the agenda, it says that this is an official delegate to vote for bylaws at the MASC conference. Um, it's possible that bylaws will be voted on, but it was my understanding from previous years that the main thing that this delegate actually votes on are the resolutions mm -hmm. and that then we would request that this person bring uh, you know, once the resolutions come out that we would, as a body, um, empower them to, uh, to vote in any particular, you know, whichever way we would like, or we just empower them to vote how they think we would vote. So um, I just wanted to clarify that, that it's not specifically just for the bylaws, I don't think, unless they've changed it. Okay, thank you. Um Member Miller, would you like to modify your motion to include resolutions? Can you, yes. Member Lee, do you accept that? Accept okay. That. Any that. discussion? 
Okay. Seeing none, roll call, please. Member Stein? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Miller? Yes. Uh, Member Goldman? Yes. Member Agna? Yes. Member Davis? Yes. Mayor Shara? Yes. Member yes. Robbins? Uh, yes. Member Gazy? Yes. Did I hear you, Member Gazy? She can't unmute, she's saying. Oh, can I see you? If you, if you give me a thumbs up, I'll, okay, thank you. And Member Seraphie Cox? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that brings us to reports and recommendations. Uh, sorry, could I ask you to just pause for one second while sure. we restart a piece of equipment that's frozen up on it? Absolutely. We're going to take a brief recess to restart equipment. Okay, we are back and we are at reports and recommendations and first up we have the superintendent's report. Okay. Good honor. Okay. Um, so within my report, there's a couple of components and I would like to start with introducing uh, Michael Sullivan, who is my um, New, assistant, uh, new superintendent induction program mentor. And if Michael could come to the podium, I do want to let you know that he, well, he'll share some things about NISIP and what I'm involved in, but he is a former educator of Northampton Public Schools, but also he served as a superintendent in Longmeadow. Uh, uh, principal and assistant. And pr principal and assistant principal, okay. All right. And so I'm going to turn it over to Michael to share a little bit about uh, NISIP and um, what I have gotten myself into. <laughs> and um, you can go from here, Michael. Okay. It's nice to be here. Half my career was right in this building, yep. as some of you know. So it's bringing back lots of memories to be here. So mm -hmm. Pre and post this edition. So. Anyway, um, yeah, so when I, after I left here, I was in Long Meadow for seven years. No, yeah, seven years, and then Gil Montague, I was there, superintendent for seven, and Bobby, I, I worked with Bobby during uh, COVID. I was the interim at Hampshire Regional uh, during that wonderful year of 2021. So uh, after that all became too much work, I, I retired kind of, and now I work for the <laughs> Mass Association of School Superintendents and uh, work with uh, supporting new superintendents in a three-year program. It's um, it, it strives to be kind of transformational in what it does. It's, it's not just to help uh, new superintendents survive, but we have very kind of ambitious goals about really helping them uh, move the needle with um, teaching and learning and equity. And um, we're, we're doing a lot of work um, in, in, the, in advancing um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's a whole ready guide that we've got. And if you're interested in, in some of the resources that MES has, MESS has now, they're extensive. Anyway, that's my commercial plug. The program is, um, it, the, the structure involves um, coaching individual sessions with new superintendents up to six hours a month. <clears throat> and then there are monthly days um, uh, Dr. monner has got one next week um, f in Marlboro for the day where um, the whole cohort of new superintendents, which is usually between 20 and 30, uh, meet to talk about uh, different, different components of the program, which include uh, how to have a very thoughtful and structured entry to a new district, and then having the outcome of that entry process set the stage for working on what's typically needed with a new superintendent is a new strategic plan or district improvement plan, um, and then helping them uh, working with their principals largely as instructional leaders to kind of advance the work of the district. 
and there's other pieces to it as well but uh, that's pretty much what we do and uh, what we ask uh, of new supers and it's a pleasure getting to know um, Portia and and working um, in Northampton again so thanks thank, thank you, you so much. thank you for being here thank you so with that it's a great segue into sharing a little bit about my entry plan for Northampton Public Schools and in your packet you should see um, this documentation I'm not going to read the whole thing because you all are very very capable but I'm going to highlight some of the components of the entry plan great you want to screen share it or not um, actually I can that will be great for the community so let me um, can I can I share my screen yeah okay. be excellent Okay, um, I just need to move this over, maybe not, maybe make it bigger. Okay. All right, very good. So, you know, as I begin my journey uh, in the district, uh, it's important to learn about the culture and the climate. And so I have been with you, it's hard to believe, but it's been two and a half months. Um, I feel like I've been here for a couple of years now. <laughs> and so over the next several months, I will develop a comprehensive picture of the culture, norms, and values of, this, of the school district, as well as uh, district and school operations and performance by identifying strengths and needs through active listening, fact gathering, and data disag disaggregation. Uh, this entry plan will be conducted in such a manner as fact gathering from key stakeholders and reviewing documents that provide insight into the operational structure of the system. It is my hope to report on these entry findings later this fall or early winter, summarizing my initial synthesis of the district's strengths, challenges, and needs. The final expected outcome of this plan will contribute to the development of a new multi-year strategic plan, which I hope that we are beginning to have a conversation about during our retreat on Monday. So the methods in terms of this, I am going to be using kind of a mix of both qualitative and quantitative protocols um, and uh, quantitatively using existing data sets and criteria used to select a range of data and then qualitatively through observations, interviews, and focus groups. And so most of you know that I have been meeting different uh, stakeholders in the community. There's still a list, and so if there's someone who I may have not interacted with, please feel free to say, Portia, here's someone else I think you need to meet. So I have seven general goals in, in terms of my process, and you can see those listed and identified in the entry protocol. And yes, thank you. It's the only thing about this. I know, I should have done it. <laughs> okay. So I have seven goals. In the, and so one, again, just identifying the norms and the values and past practices of the system by conferencing with members of the school district. Um, I've already had the uh, pleasure of speaking with your former full-time superintendent, uh, John Provost, who has shared uh, some things about Northampton Public Schools. And then identifying key issues concerning all stakeholders in order to establish priorities. Um, there is one that I'm going to actually talk about this evening, and that's uh, the bullying concerns in the district began establishing um, key relationships with stakeholder groups and identify what the community wants from their superintendent and what a Northampton graduate looks like. So, and then learn the social and cultural and political <laughs> and technical dimensions of the position, identify the strengths of Northampton public schools, including the things to be built upon and continue the strategic work that is occurring with the district improvement plan, ensure that the district's DEIB, which stands for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging stance is manifested throughout our practices, our actions, and processes. And then ascertain the academic rigor and quality of the curricular programs from preparing students for college and career, 
assess curricular um, for its relevancy and cultural responsiveness to engage all students, building relationships with students from marginalized groups. So what I've learned so far about Northampton and its schools is that uh, it is definitely a student-centered school district in Massachusetts and is focused on closing equity gaps while maintaining academic rigor. Educational gaps uh, exist within the district and there is a strong desire from the community that this be addressed. Northampton also prides itself in academic excellence with the realm of student choice, allowing students the freedom to direct their own path of learning. As the school system grows more diverse in the student body, it must pivot to address the disparities found within the changing demographics of learners. A balance must be met in which resources are applied equitably to ensure all children reach their potential. So a little bit about my core value system, and these are my beliefs, not the district's beliefs, but um, in terms of my core values, there's three areas that I always think about, and one is being, of course, students first, and then teachers and uh, the curriculum. And so with students, I got you here. <laughs> with students, hmm, I believe and am committed to ensuring that each and every child has equal access to opportunities and receives what they need to be successful. Uh, it is an inherent right that every child be given an opportunity to learn. And with a diverse student body, students have the privilege of gaining more understanding about people and backgrounds from all over. This contributes to diversity of thought and perspectives that make learning more engaging and, and dynamic. For teachers, I believe teachers bring the skill set to the instruction. They create the environment that is conducive for learning in their classroom. They manage the routines and practices and are the ones who determine the level, level of rigor within the content. Teachers are the ones who control the climate of the classroom environment, determining whether it is welcoming and inclusive in which differences are celebrated. And then lastly, I believe that curriculum is the roadmap or the tool that drives what teachers do. It is what is taught and can vary based upon the teacher's responsiveness to their students' needs, their culture, and their abilities. So curriculum is, uh, and the resources and materials must be representative and inclusive and relatable to the student's student body that's being served. And so the last part of the entry plan, you will see a timeline and examples of specific actions in which I will um, be involved in and actually carrying out during my next 10 months in the district. And um, again, I, I ask you to really review this tool because this is really guiding my, my thinking, my thought process, my, my uh, fact gathering, and it will help me in terms of uh, the goal setting and uh, projecting or, or what is it, future casting in terms of where we're going as a district. So you can look at that. And then the last page of the, of the document you will see that there's a list of groups uh, that I will be meeting with or I have already met with. Uh, and then there are a listing of documents and, and protocols to review while I am in district. And so that's where I'm going to end with the entry plan. Um, before I go to um, mentioning about the bullying and the update of the backlog minutes, are there any questions? on the entry plan and please I do ask for your input if you have comments or thoughts or Portia have you thought of this please send me an email or call me okay. I just want to thank you for this it's very clear and it's a helpful guide for us as well to find out the ways that we can support you and I look forward to our retreat because of what, how you've set the stage for this. So thank you very much. Any other questions or comments on this plan? Okay, I don't see any. Okay, all right. 
Okay, I wanted to update um, the members as well as the community in terms of the concerns that were brought to us uh, the last school committee meeting where we had two of our uh, parents, our caregivers, to um, bring their concerns and, and their thoughts on our current um, uh, bullying policy and implementation plan. So being new to the district, I actually inherited um, the, the implementation plan that was actually in the process of being renewed um, by the, the interim superintendent. And so I had a document, but I don't know if the document was vetted. And so, um, so first steps, I took the document and I had a conversation. Well, actually, I didn't really have a conversation. I sent it to Layla and said, Layla, help. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, our attorney had the opportunity to take a look at that. And um, I'm glad because she shared with me uh, to say, Portia, look at the bullying policy, look at the anti-discrimination policy. Um, and then look at the uh, code of conduct. So there's a, those are documents in which everything in terms of the language should be clear and be consistent. So we are working on doing that. So, uh, so within the last few days, I have been able, that document is updated and I shared it with the ALT team uh, during our meeting this week. So they're reviewing it and they're making comments and suggestions that they have until tomorrow. But the goal is that we are going to have um, all stakeholder groups to have an opportunity to review the plan, uh, to get comments on the plan. So how we're going to do that is that we're going to take the document and it's going to be attached in our district monthly uh, newsletter. We're also going to put it on our website. I know the website needs some work, but we're gonna put it on the website so there's different um, avenues or venues where they where our stakeholders can see the um, the actual plan, and then also Bill Worley, at the principal at the high school, he has uh, his student union group. He is going to have them also review the guide. I'm actually giving 15 days for our stakeholders to make comments. We are sending copies to uh, Chief Casper and uh, Corey. Um, so our liaison, what was it, Corey Robinson? Corey Robinson. I'm still learning the names. And so they're going to review it. Uh, we have, and so, and then the staff. So the staff is also going to have a chance to review it as well as NACE as their own body. But at least the staff will all have input. So that's the, uh, that's the goal there. The next step is to bring it to Holly's, um, the subcommittee for um, rule policy, rules and policy which if the timing is right, <laughs> they will also have an opportunity to weigh in um, on that. And I can also share some of the feedback that we're getting. Um, and from there, I'm hoping then Holly's uh, subcommittee will then bring it to the full school committee for their um, vetting or their final approval. And so there are, um, we're excited that we're doing this, but it is a needed tool. Mm -hmm. So in the meanwhile, while we are doing all of this, mm -hmm. we are still utilizing what has been in place. We do have protocols to investigate bullying um, concerns, and we want to make sure that uh, parents know that they can, they can submit uh, reports uh, to their administrators, and, uh, or they can call in, and so on. And th that I've been working with the principals in terms of our steps and our procedures and protocols and how we respond to our families. And it should be done in a timely manner. So um, that's one of the areas in which we are working on. Um, again, also some of the other parent groups, just in case too, is the, our CPAC and our LPAC and our PTAs. Okay. Okay. Member Levy? Thanks. Yeah, I know you've got more to report. So is this okay? Timing? That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for such a comprehensive, uh, inclusive uh, process for reviewing the policy. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to hear so many stakeholders are involved. Um, I agree this is a very, very necessary step. 
I also imagine you will agree that it's not a sufficient step. Uh, there's a lot more we need to be doing as well. And so while we absolutely want our, our families, our caregivers to know the steps to, to be able to report instances of bullying and we want there to be clear and consistent protocols in place, so thank you for that. Um, I'm curious, and, and I also know that you may not know the answer to this yet, and that's okay, but I would love to know, if not now, at a future meeting, um, what the steps are that are in place that are taking a proactive approach to bullying so that our students are really thinking about what it is to be an intentional part of an inclusive community and what their role is uh, as, an, as an active member of that community. Excellent. So, Dina, we have, uh, we being the alt team, have already started that conversation. There are things that are already in place in our various schools that are addressing some of that. To be proactive, to create a climate and a culture um, that is, that values all state, all the children who are there. Uh, and so, for the elementaries, uh, the principal shared with me that they have second step, and specifically second step, uh, the anti-bullying uh, curriculum. That's one piece. Uh, there are uh, two elementary pro, uh, schools that are doing um, responsive classroom, which is an overall view of setting a positive climate in your classroom, but it also affects uh, the academics and the rigor of the academics. Uh, for the middle school, this I believe this is year two for their implementation of a program called Ruler, which is uh, through um, Yale's Child Study Program, and that is uh, something that they're uh, implementing in their schools, and I could probably share a little bit more about that next time when we come together. And then the high school, and um, we know the high school is different, but they have their flex block schedule, and I know that um, Bill Worley is working on um, really strategically putting lessons uh, that are appropriate for that level. But we talked very, and this is just, we just started the surface of these conversations. So, you know, I said, I said to Bill, I said, well, there's, there's one component that we have actually at all schools is the fact that we have our crisis team, but we also have our social workers and so on. So there's, there's that piece there that can run uh, restorative circles and all those kinds of things. And we still are working with, uh, don't ask me, I think it's collaborative, uh, who is doing some work with us in terms of restorative practices. Mm -hmm. So there's, there is much work that's going on in the district. So now for me is to put it all together and, and show the administrators that there is a connection to the work that we're doing, but also share that with um, our caregivers to let them know that this is what's in your building and the purpose of this. So we've got some work to do, but we'll, we'll share it piece by piece. So that's another piece to the, to the plan. And then also just resources for families too. Thank you. And it's, it's helpful to hear the, the new things that are happening uh, because I think in talking about what is currently in place or what has already been in place, we have parents up here and caregivers up here telling us that they're not they're not sufficient. So I'm I'm happy to hear there's more that's being done and more to come as well. Member Miller, um, yes, I'm so sorry. Number, go ahead. Okay. Um, two things. One was that I had a thought just that I'm that in terms of caretakers <coughs> that. I'm assuming it will be put on Parent Square, so that's that's good. Um, I've I actually have a, quite a lot of experience with um, bullying type of situations and um, the impact and the traumatic impact on it on kids, um, and I'm assuming. A, the adjustment counselors at every level will be involved because they're very good. Um, but I also wonder if it includes things like safety plans mm. specific to individuals. So yes, you will find that in there. So that was actually in our old plan. We haven't changed from that. And 
And so, yes, that's a part of it as well. Number nine, and then nine. Um, I'm really grateful that you jumped into this so quick. Um, uh, as a prior municipal security district and laid out a really comprehensive plan on how to move it forward. Um, I had just a few, you touched on some of the things I was going to say, so I'll, I'll just briefly reiterate them. But um, just, I wanted to say, you know, as a parent who's had to go through the policies on this, like you said, like the, the actual bullying policy, the anti-discrimination policy, and the code of conduct, not only don't have the same language, but often it's unclear what the remedies are. Mm -hmm. And there also seems to be a real burden put on um, administrators with wide discretion. So as a caregiver, when you read it, you don't actually know what any sort of um, steps are. Like, so if there is a substantiated claim, of blame, well, that ha what happens, right? And if there's a safety plan, then what happens? And like, what happens as these things progress and what your remedies are? So it's, it's very opaque. And I think both parents and staff and administrators don't really know what to do when faced with difficult situations. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and then we've talked a lot about restorative justice for a few years. We've appropriated money. We haven't spent it. We've done all this sort of stuff. But I would really, and you've mentioned this, I'd really like to see um, how those practices and those ideas would be infused into the next generation of our um, bullying policy and our practices. Um, and I'm really excited that you're looking at the current intervention strategies for curriculum, like second, like. What is working and what is not working? Is it actually a good curriculum, but we're falling down in these other areas? Or is the curriculum, you know, how do we support it better? Like, what, what do we need to do? And I'm just really happy that you're all looking at it, and really supportive of it, and really grateful. And the last thing I just want to mention that stuck with me, and I hadn't considered because I have elementary kids who aren't on social media or phones, but one of the parents that spoke that you're responding to specifically brought up, like, issues of cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming like those elements are part of whatever draft plan you use. Yes. Draft. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. See, I'm taking notes too. Okay. Are you ready to move on? <laughs> yes. I, I was with Member Robinson. Can I go to you? Oh, yes. Go ahead, Eileen. That's fine. Yeah. Go ahead, Eileen. Okay, thank you. I didn't see your hand up. I'm sorry. I just was wondering, it sound, I think I heard. For elementary, I think you said one school uses second step and the others don't because they have a responsive classroom. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering that consistency mm -hmm. among schools might really okay. help with communication between the administrators. And so absolutely, and, and I saw Gwen shaking her head. So they all use the second step. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's that is definitely consistent. Okay. I thought it was like mm -hmm. something. No, something. it's not hodgepodge. Okay. Okay. So, but. Um, but the ruler is unique to the middle school. Right. And that's a unique program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to say thank you so much. Um, I, I think it takes a lot for constituents to come and comment about something that's really bothering them and make their voices heard for the school committee and the tremendous impact of knowing that you have immediately followed up on what you heard is, is a wonderful and powerful first step for us and I'm incredibly appreciative of it. Um, I remember seeing this plan as a draft and I don't think we ever really saw it. I saw it in the G drive mm -hmm. and I thought um, I, I had a lot of opinions about it um, but from where it started this the early draft that came from March um, and I don't know where it was generated from or what it was addressing and I I was waiting for it to come back to us at some point, so I'm very glad to hear that it's back in the process again uh, before being presented in that format. Um, it sounds like a lot of the conversations you're going to be doing also, as you talked before about um, the culture and the climate that produces good citizens, you know, people who care about each other, and that that's something that gets scaffolded as kids grow in our community. These are the expectations that we expect of human beings. Um, in, in our community and this is how we care for each other is another really powerful concept and curricular in, some, in many ways which may, I, I'm guessing, will come back to us possibly um, for thinking about funding for time for teachers to work on this and possible um, you know, outside resources to be able to benefit their being able to talk and work on it. 
So being kept aware of that will be terrific. And then finally, of course, that big question, which is, if it works, so how are we going to know it's working, and what will we, what will our schools look like if they're, you know, what are we, what's the goal that we're going towards? You know, is it this rosy, perfect, gorgeous thing, or are we going to be, you know, you said you're going to be looking at the data for what gets reported, what gets followed through, and um, one of the things we have heard from constituents is a lot of falling through the cracks. So people who feel as though they have brought a concern um, to an official of some kind, whether it's a teacher or um, a, another representative of the school and felt like they didn't get anywhere with that. Um, I'm, I'm a little worried about how we will know that those folks' are, voices are still being heard and that we're keeping some kind of a record of that and we maybe at the end will be looking at those numbers and that data, um, but also that other big picture. So what, is, what do those schools look like when they're working as caring and, and nurturing places? But thank you so much for starting this. It sounds like a wonderful process. Feel free to bring it to the curriculum, climate, and culture committee too. We'd be love. We'd love to look at it. Yeah. Remember, Anna. Having been at the first training for Second Step, which was, I don't even know when it was, 15 years ago, maybe. I think we all talked about how important it was to have continuous. Uh, like vaccinations, I guess, mm -hmm. because it doesn't, one little shot isn't going to do the, the job. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just really, I know the burden that's on teachers about this. And not that they reject it or um, think it's not part of their job, but there's so many parts of their job that um, I think I just like to say to the teachers and also the principals, I know how hard it is to find places for this. And I think as, as educators, we can make climate and culture a part of everything, every part of it's the true. teaching, so that it doesn't have to be, okay, now we're gonna talk about this and it's mm -hmm. a separate subject. But I think that um, it needs to have some renewal for all those people who've come in the district since mm -hmm. it was first inoculated. <laughs> and. Um, mm -hmm that I know the response of classroom schools and that is an also an incredible intervention as far as building culture in classrooms. And just um, acknowledge the fact that the, the pressure on teachers right now for everything that they're doing is pretty tremendous. Um, so if there's any way that we can help either in the budget process <laughs> to put aside time for teachers to, to meet, I know that that's really a, a big one. Um, and and support them in all that they're trying to do to build that kind of culture in their classrooms. Thank you. Anyone who hasn't spoken yet? I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to go to Member Miller and then Member Stein. Um, first of all, I just want to echo what Member Robin said, which is I think it's terrific that you are responding so fast after some parents got up and spoke, I think that shows responsiveness that is really important. And following that idea, from my work experience, frankly, um, I think what's really important for caretakers, sometimes even when a school can do nothing to stop something that they can't see, um, and that's in terms of the burden on teachers, it's a lot of stuff happens that is out of sight. This is true. It is not seen by anyone, and that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. But I do think it helps caretakers a lot when an administrator, a principal in a school or whatever, says, this is what we know and this is what we're doing and this is what we can't do and we're really sorry we can't do anything about this but this is what we are doing and I think parent caretakers really appreciate that because often they feel like they're not getting any answer at all and they tell the story and nothing happens but I know nothing I know something's happening but the parent doesn't know that. So I think that's extremely helpful to parents is to know, or caretakers, to know 
this is what we are doing, this is what we can't do, blah, 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 that kind of thing. So. Um, yeah, I just had two things. Um, one uh, follows up on what Member Miller was saying. Um, I think, in at least my experience, I think sometimes uh, staff understand there are privacy rights involved and don't know how to respond, so don't say anything, which feeds that sort of thing. So again, training or sort of discussion about, well, what is this actual obligation and how do you navigate it? Um, a related thing is I often, uh, at least in my experience, have seen, um, we, we have students with, you know, we, we have had this big push for um, more inclusion, less out of district placements. We have many IEPs. We have students with all sorts of accommodations and in a world of many accommodations and rights, there seems to be competing things that in a situation like this, you don't know how to manage. And it's not clear how to manage. Like, well, how do I hold X accountable if it also says I need to do this? And how do I practically do it? And how do I you know, professionally do it? And I think that's a really difficult situation for administrators and teachers. And I think they need help on how to balance those things or, or manage those difficult situations. And the last question I had was really for Member Robbins to see if the previous plan had been referred to the Budget and Property Committee. I don't think it was ever completed. It was just um, on the G drive, and it was a document that said it was a draft. And I just happened to be looking at the G drive about bullying, and it came up. So yeah. Well, I would make a motion to refer the policy that comes out of the process that um, Superintendent Bonner described to the budget and property <coughs> subcommittee so we don't have to go through that process again later. It could just go right there whenever it's done. You, I'm sorry, yeah. rules and pause, my apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Right. Don't do it to us. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> my apologies, yes, rules and policy. Member Stein, I will, it, it'll probably be going to um, rules and policy on Friday. I just wanted to give the uh, alt team an opportunity to really have their, their feedback before I send it to you. Because there's some things that they may know that I don't know that I should include. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that, like, as I understand it, we have to ref do we have to refer things to the subcommittees, or do certain things just automatically go there? We seem to do it both ways. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to say if we referred it, then there's not even, like, a process question. Like, do we refer, like, we usually vote to say we want you guys to do this. Um, but is that only on special things or everything? I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I'm going to see if Emily, member Emily or Emily has yeah. a, has an answer to that. It might be if it's not if it's in front of us, then we have to refer it for it to go somewhere. If it's not actually in front of us, just yeah. Let's let's see what member Gazy has to say. Sarah P. Cox. Well, member Gazy has her hand up. Yeah. Maybe she can't unmute though. Here she is. Unmute. Oh, she can't unmute. unmute. Okay, now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, yes, we have a number of those policies already referred that we have been working on, ACAC, ACR, and part of our um, charge is to make all the, that bullying, intervention plan correspond with all of the, um, the the code of conduct, with ACR, with all the different areas where it also connects. So I'm not sure if we need to refer that policy because I think it's already been a part of our discussions. Okay, thank great. you, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Any further discussion on this? Thank you so much, Dr. Bonner. This is really last yeah. last thing. I will never be this long again. Wow. <laughs> until until evaluation time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So this this is in response to um, uh, the request on last school committee meeting when we were talking about um, our minutes and how to expedite uh, really addressing the backlog. And uh, Member Stein has suggested that we take a look at the AI. Um, and so um, there is a chart in your packet 
I won't share the screen again. So there's a chart in your packet that lists some uh, types of software programs or uh, transcription programs that we could potentially take a look at. And first of all, the mayor has already tipped us off on the Otter AI. And that one happens to be free, by the way. <laughs> like um, that. Yes. Um, uh, and then um, Member Stein has worked with the GNOME board, and so you could speak to that. But there's just a couple of things. Regardless of whether we use AI or not, there's still some human element that's required in taking a look at what's been transcribed for accuracy. Um, you know, these the software programs are relatively or fairly uh, still being developed, so so it, it the recognition sometimes might be off. Um, if the volume's not loud enough, it may it may miss a word or misinterpretation of the pronunciation of the words. You know, uh, so and the duration of the meetings. So it just it all depends upon um, our 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 usage. So w there will still be that human element that would have to go through and edit and make sure that there's still accuracy. Um, but who knows, down the, down the road we might do a um, combination of the two where you do have using AI that's doing that transcription reporting and then you have the clerk of the school committee to then edit and put those final touches in there with, with, roll, um, with the roll call votes and so on. Um, so just to give you a quick update, you know, um, working with uh, Annie during the course of the last two and a half months is that you know we tried to chunk the number there's numerous uh, voluminous is that the word that we should use uh, in terms of <laughs> in terms of the the number of minutes that have been backlogged and and so one thing that I have really kind of um, asked Annie is that we at least stay current so you'll see that she made every effort to get the last meeting's minutes ready, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the regular meeting as well as the executive. And so I, I'm going to encourage her to, to continue to do that. And um, she has two assistants, and I spoke with Bobby today that we could probably keep until um, maybe the end of October. We're looking at the count. We just have to watch the hours. So, um, and so. Okay, so we are making every effort to really make this go away um, because it, 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 um, it, it is a weight on you all. Um, it changes the dynamics in the office because this is something that is pulling us away as a distractor mm -hmm. from the work that needs to be done uh, in real time. But I did wanted to let you know, and then uh, my um, my mentor, my coach, suggested that um, instead of me actually taking a look at all these software components is to involve CES <laughs> in terms of uh, maybe they could give us a recommendation in terms of where we should go. All right, so I am finished, Mary. Great recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Member Sarah Fee Cox and then Member Stein. I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, member Sarah Fee Cox. Uh, yeah, just a quick um, thing about otter.ai is that um, I believe that it's free for a certain number of transcriptions, but after that number, then you have to pay. So you might just want to double check that. Thanks. Always a catch. Otherwise, great. Can you well, ask about the question about the referral to whether we have to do that from here or not for rules and policy? Did you hear that question from before, Member Sarfi Cox, about? referring some if something's not before us um, and it's just going to go to a subcommittee does it have to be referred there by us if it's not before us as a whole body and needs to be referred to rules and policy does it need to be referred right so for example um, if since the bullying policy wasn't it wasn't before us it was just being talked about and dr bonner said it was it would be going to rules and policy or she was going to send it there uh -huh. would we need to refer it there or could she just deliver it there without us assisting oh yeah because it's the it's the plan it's not a policy mm -hmm. okay. so well there's two there is it, it, 
there's two documents. There right. is the bullying policy, and then there's the, the yes. plan. So both of them have been updated. Yes, and the bullying policy um, was something that the Rules and Policy Subcommittee was working on either earlier this year or last year. I, so, so it had already been referred to us. Yes, it ended up not being that's what, a that's good that's example of the question that. because Got it's it. already there. <laughs> but it was more what, you know, would we have, if that was not the case, would we have to refer it or could, um, could Dr. Bonner just uh, deliver it there without a referral from the full committee to the subcommittee? Um, I, meant I, I think, that, yes, <laughs> I think that um, this is more of a practice, that it, I think that it's more of a practice of our own. It might say something in the rules of procedure about that, but it, it's not like it's um, in Robert's rules or, you know, if the, the full committee doesn't have to refer every issue that the subcommittee works on, like the other subcommittees. So I, it, we can look further into that in the rules of procedure, but I think that it's just been a practice in the past instead of like something that's more codified. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Member Stein. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, so I, I wanted to thank Al and the folks at NOM for trying to see what it would look like with their software for transcription. And because they, you know, they record all our meetings. And essentially, the reason I was interested in it was you know, we have so many voluminous meetings. Um, to deal with that, and we're all killing ourselves reviewing minutes, and it, we can't do it fast enough, and it's a slow process. Would it be easier to just have it transcribed, and then that's the way to deal with it? Um, and they can transcribe like an hour of it in 12 minutes on the system that they have, and there's different formats. The problem is when you look at it, you can train it to uh, recognize voices and stuff, but there would be so much editing that would need to be done on so many pages that it doesn't really save enough time to justify it as a solution to move us forward. It doesn't mean we couldn't use that type of stuff for something else, but I don't know that it's going to help us in this situation like I was hoping it would. Um, so that was deflating. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, we could try to see if we could train it, but I, I still think there would be so much labor involved that we wouldn't end up saving time. It might cost, you know, create more work. So it just seemed like an unfortunate result. But um, yeah, the, the other thing I was going to say was um, I don't know how much longer we can keep doing the, the interview as a body. There's just so it's just taking us away from other work. Uh, it's a lot to ask each of you to listen to a five hour meeting and to make a bunch of corrections. Um, and I, I don't know what to do. Um, last time we had asked, we tasked Dr. Bonner with coming up with a plan, hoping maybe at the next meeting we can have a plan. What I'm worried about is we only have the temps through October and even the minutes we're getting that they worked on that we reviewed the last meeting were highly insufficient. So I, I would love to see like how many meetings have we still not approved? How many oh. haven't been created? You know, when we looked at it before, when, before we started in July, it was like 270, 290 meetings. And I just don't see how we're gonna get it done and I'm worried about it. Um, so I want like a, a real plan that doesn't involve us having to do that, which is gonna take us years to get it done, yeah. Wow. So it took you years to create the, the mess, <laughs> as we say, the backlog. And it's not just this, this body. Mm -hmm. It was other school committee. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're looking at minutes all the way back to 2018. Um, and then you must remember that there was a pandemic period. So there was numerous meetings during that time. Mm -hmm. um, but. The, you, you ask for a plan, so the plan is already in place. We've mm -hmm. chunked the number of meetings and we've divvied them up in terms of the, the three individuals who are working on those minutes. So it's really, it's, it's going to require time. It took, it took a long time to create the problem, so you need to allow time to, you know, to, to address the problem. And, 
you know, if you look at the number of minutes that you've been improving, and I've only been with, this is my second meeting with you, so there's been a large chunk of, of minutes, but when you say that number, 270 meetings, and majority of them being five to six hours long, it's a lot of work. So the so I will ask this because in Robert's rules of order as well as um, uh, the the open meeting laws and in terms of how you're reporting, we are the the types of minutes that you're getting are like word for word transcripts. Mm -hmm. So I think what now is that you need to allow there to be summaries. Mm -hmm. You know the, the most important part is the actual vote, what you voted for, the vote. And, and the consensus of that vote. So, so if you would allow for the remainder of the minutes that are coming forth to be more summary as opposed to be literal transcripts of these meetings, it may expedite some of that, but it's still gonna take some time. But, but you know, respectfully, um, the reason we voted last session to ask for a plan was because the current plan is not working. And we don't have word for word. Like if we look at the transcription, it's 45 pages. Longest meeting notes we probably have are 18. They are summaries. There is a question of like what's an adequate summary and what's a good summary, and that's worth talking about. But the issues we're having are far more basic. Are <laughs> items being left off? Are votes not taken correctly? Are motions missed? Like, and the ones we have gotten through since you've been here, a number of those have been worked on successive times over a number of months. And the plan we're on now is in its ninth month. And at that pace, based on the volume, we will not get anywhere. So it's not working, which is why we said we need a new plan to get this done. Because yes, it could take a long time, but the Attorney General is not saying you have all the time in the world. We're so sorry it took you so long. It's get it done. And you were supposed to get it done by these dates. And every plan that has been put in place and every resource that has been spent on this hasn't moved the needle and hasn't moved it fast enough. So <coughs> that's why we voted to ask for a new plan. And I, I, it's, yeah. So I don't think that, um, you know, I, I don't think that we feel like there needs to be a transcript or that they need to be as long. What we know is that they need to be sufficient according to what the which, and so there are certain things that have been corrected to make sure that we're in compliance, and then um, there are some other things that involve having a um, sort of a, f a fuller summary than what had been done before. But I, I'm sure that, you know, I, some of these minutes are very, very detailed, some of them aren't. They're kind of all over the map a little bit, um, but they, what we know is that they have to be sufficient and that they need to capture what was said by the members and by anyone presenting in a way that they hadn't been. Member Robbins. I appreciate the dilemma because we still haven't figured out a way to do this. And it's going to, you're right, you know, whatever it is we do is going to take time. Um, it's going to take some ingenuity. It certainly sounds like using some sort of AI format might be really helpful. But I actually have found it tremendously time consuming to sit down and have having to do this and sit through our meetings, but it was really educational. Um, I wish we had had that information to look at as members of this committee in in an informative way. So if it had been a very spare summary of what happened and what the vote was at the meetings, it wouldn't have helped me know what the dilemma was for those people who were having that conversation at that time. And it was incredibly informative, and I, I enjoyed that. I would love to have had those minutes to look at um, over the last two years. So there's there's some kind of a fine line between when I think it's okay to have a quick summary. We took a vote I mean, on these items here, but stuff that um, has a history and might be more controversial, it's, it's terrific to be able to see that written down on a piece of paper and know what the dilemma was. I know I've made phone calls to previous school committee members to say, hey, when that came up for you, what was that like? And they can't remember. And they don't have any minutes to look at. So so maybe there's some way to be able to say, um, you know, there's a format for saying what needs to just be summarized to meet the AG's requirement 
and what can we really look at that needs a little bit more depth in depth conversation that is accurate as well because as um, member stein said the ones that we've been looking at recently that have been redone twice um, are often not very accurate sadly okay any every minute creates more minutes so any further <laughs> <laughs> that was well said okay I got a so if there, are you done with your i am finished thank okay. you Great. um then let's move on to bobby and the business administrator report please okay so um should i share my screen or First thing I'd like to do is the end of 2023 report. Sure, if that's if that's easy for you. Well, I'm not sure it will be, but I'll give it a college try. Can we can we assist you in some way? Which let me check it out. Okay. We'll see. Okay. Ooh, look at me. <laughs> Now we can rotate it. Mm. Any suggestions? I'm not sure. Might have to open it with Google there yeah, to be able to do that, Bobby. But I don't know if that will mess up the format or not. Sometimes, sometimes that happens. Uh, so do you know how to do that? No. If you go, click right in there. Okay. So right above the document, it says "Open with." Nope, right in the middle of the, do oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so right in the middle, uh, go into the document. Up top. Up top. Where it says yeah. open, open with. Open with. So if you, if you put your, yeah, go to put your cursor on the document. All right, on the document. And then right above in the middle, it says open with. There's a, uh, yeah, click yep. on that. And if you choose Google Docs, I hope it doesn't mess up the format. But you'll probably be able to uh, rotate a little once it loads up. Okay. Bobby, this is Kaya. Can you hear me? Yes. I already downloaded that document and rotated all of the pages and saved it, and I just emailed it to you. So if this isn't working, or if you'd like an alternative, you might be able to check your email for an email from me that has this document with the correct orientation. Member Goldman, uh, maybe you could share your screen with those documents. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I'm working on two computers, so I'll just move the document over. I'll be right with you. All right, you're going to do that. Thank you. And Bobby, you should stop sharing your screen so, so that Kaya can share her screen. All right. Member Goldman. <laughs> In the meantime, I can um, say that the warrants are in your packet. Those have been previously approved by um, Member Agna. The personnel report is in your packet as well. Um, my um, report is in the packet and basically just says that we will share the 23 um, appropriation budget um, end of year um, included in the packet is the 24 um, first report for the uh, fiscal 24 and I'll do an in-depth look at that at the October meeting um, and then um, just that Dr. Bonner and myself have already started um, talking about um, the budget process and, and what we're going to do with that. Any of these other topics you can cover, Bobby? Um, if we want to let Mistel go, 
She could do her presentation. That would be great. You want to do that? Sure, let's do that. Hi, Miss Dell. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to also attempt to share my screen, and this will be a first for me. Dr. Bonner's oh, ready, Ms. Dell, to share it if you'd like. I can, I can share. Uh, I have your slide presentation, unless you've changed it. I did not share, change it, no, you can go ahead. So I had um, emailed it as a PDF earlier, though, so I'm not sure that it would be the same slide presentation, but we can go from there. Oh, yeah. You see it? Yep. I'm just going to make it a little larger. Okay. It's not as pretty, mm -hmm. but it's it's there. That's okay. It gets the point of cross. Uh, although there will be some fine print, but that is okay. We can talk about it. So thanks so much for having me. I um, thought I'd share a little bit about a program and how they are Fresh Campton Farm to School Programming um, and briefly just talk about um, some of the nutritional standards for school meals. Um, on this front first page here, actually, it's very exciting. We have strawberries there. We just served this past week from Sunderland, which is pretty exciting to have local strawberries in September. They have a really unique variety of strawberries that fruit into a frost. Um, and the top right is actually an example of a lunch at JFK. So on the next slide, I just kind of was briefly touching on what we've been up to. So we have been working hard to enhance um, student participation, student choice and voice by increasing access to healthy foods. Uh, we have successfully been increasing our participation in both our breakfast and our lunch programs. Breakfast participation has doubled um, since 2018. And now um, about 48%, so nearly half of Northampton students enjoy lunch at school, and that has gone up from 33% since 2018. We have been collaborating with community partners and farms to increase access for our school programs, as well as increasing access to nutritious foods outside of the school day. So I'm excited to talk more about that in the next slide. We um, consistently offer taste tests in our elementary schools that align with the Massachusetts Farm to School Harvest of the Month program. And we recently received some grant awards to promote and prom work on our farm to school programming. So um, one of our community collaborations is what we're referring to as our WINS program. It is um, weekend nutrition for Northampton students. It's a pilot program that's starting at Bridge Street School. And it's starting actually tomorrow, where um, families can be provided on Friday afternoon, two breakfasts, two lunches, and two snacks for the weekend meals, or an equivalent in a grocery gift card. Um, it's pretty exciting pilot, and we're hoping to be able to expand that in the coming years to the other schools. And on to the next slide, I would just briefly kind of talk about um, our recent grant funding. So in the spring of this past spring, we received $47,000 from the Department of Education um, in a mass fresh grant. And then over the summer, we learned that we were receiving the USDA Farm to School Implementation Grant. Both of these grants are, will be supporting our existing strengths in our Farm to School programming, specifically school garden programs, our local procurement, and building more community partnerships, um, and more um, Excitingly, launching our Fresh Kids program, which is going to be an elementary classroom education program to teach students where their food comes from, to make you know help them make more informed food choices and have a positive impact on their health. And this will be done through School Sprouts, who also works with our school garden programs. Um, more specifically, on a building-specific level, in the elementary schools through this grant funding, all elementary students will have access to field trips to community gardens with an educational component through Grow Food Northampton. In the middle school, we're working on a program called Club Food Fight, and it'll be an after school <laughs> program to learn about food systems, their and the students' impact on those food systems and how they can help improve them. And at the high school, we'll have opportunities for internships that will be land-based agricultural and food justice learning opportunities, again, supported through Grow Food Northampton. 
This um, funding is also going to be used to continue to increase access to local foods in our school meal program and also help promote awareness of our Fresh Hampton Farm to School programming. And we're really excited to have yet another annual Farm to School Summit um, this upcoming spring. We did this back in 2019 to kind of just show the work that we have been doing in the beginning of our Farm to School programming as well as you know, school nutrition um, information. <laughs> Thanks. So this slide just shows how we've been gradually increasing our fresh food being local. So back in 2018, 0.4% of our fresh food was local. This past school year, 25% of our fresh food was local. And our lofty goal for this upcoming school year is for about 40% of our fresh food in our school programs to be local. I didn't want to end today without kind of touching on, and this is where the very small print comes in, so I do apologize, <laughs> touching on the USDA nutrition standards. Um, it's important that families and community understands that we do have to follow the USDA meal patterns, um, but also more important for everyone to understand that we are compliant with school meal patterns and we exceed their nutritional standards. Um, and so these are just the examples of what they do require for school meals, down to the specific colors of the vegetables that need to be served every week, um, calories, fat, sodium, and so forth. Um, even more specifically on the next slide, if we were to break down, and then speaking of exceeding standards, if we were to break down the average nutritional um, nutrition of a five-day lunch menu on the elementary level, they average about 550 calories, which is within range, 900 milligrams of sodium, which is below standard. And while it's not actually being monitored or regulated yet, we are keeping our eye on the added sugars in our school meals. And we have found that about 10% of calories is from added sugars in our school lunches in the elementary level. And we, we look at the high school and we also look at the standards for breakfast as well. This is just a lunch example. Um, they are looking to change these proposed standards and by fall of 2027, the proposed standard for added sugar in school meals will be less than 10% of calories. So it, was exciting, it is exciting to know that we're already kind of ahead of the game and we're on top of that. Again, small pictures, but I just wanted to share some examples of our school meals. Um, in the bottom right corner is a barbecue chicken flatbread, a little leaf salad, because we source little leaf for all of our salads and all of our meals in all of our schools. The top right is a yogurt and granola parfait. Our granola is from Jeff's Granola in Longmeadow. And the top, it seems very small, but it's a very large baked potato. The potato is from Hadley. It's a house-made chili made with meatless crumbles from deeply rooted farms and beans. On the left is a hummus and veggie wrap, and in the middle is the banh mi that we serve in our high school. <laughs> and in line with the taste test, um, the pictures there is our harvest of the month. I think it was February, I could be wrong was winter squash, and so that's an example of our taste testing during lunch at Leeds. We do this at all the elementary schools. They got to taste the difference between Bora Bora squash and butternut squash and tell us what they thought. Okay. And it's just fun and interactive and getting the children to try new foods that they may not have tried before. And I wanted to end with saying that I use the word we a lot, and in we I'm really meaning all of the fabulous school nutrition staff across all six of our schools as well as our Farm to School coordinator, Brian Jersky, who's been absolutely instrumental in expanding a lot of our programs and obtaining these grants that we have now. So, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you for this great presentation and for all that you and your team does. Um, everything looks absolutely delicious. Um, I was able to be at the kickoff for the weekend um, a food program yesterday, which is um, is being funded by seed or the pilots being funded by um, uh, an ARPA community grant from the city, and so I got to go to that kickoff, and it was just really a beautiful um, group of people who are working really hard to to start that program, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to expand it. So um, I'm so mm -hmm. grateful for all the volunteers who are part of it. And if anyone wants to volunteer, I know that they're looking for volunteers for that program. So thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, and feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in volunteering, and I can um, definitely connect with those folks. Thanks. Member Levy. 
Thank you so much for the presentation and for all of the work you're doing. I know you care deeply about healthy food. I do too. And I wonder if you can help us understand. I appreciate um, the goals and the lofty goals you have of um, ensuring the fresh fruit and veggies, the certain percentage of fresh fruit and veggies that will come from local farms. I wonder if you know, and it's okay if you don't know, but if you have a sense of the percentage of fruits and vegetables that our kids are served that are fresh. We try to make sure that half the tray. So if you saw on those photos, we try to make sure, so when we're offering fruits and vegetables, we make sure at least half that offering is fresh. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thanks. Um, I'm curious, just given uh, the percentage of, of calories that come from sugar, uh, if there's work that's being done to lower the sugar and lower the carbs, especially when we look at the breakfasts that students are getting, knowing that our students who are relying on breakfast at school really need that energy to take them through the day, what are we doing to ensure that those meals especially, but all of our meals, have fresh fruits and are low sugar and low carbs so that they've got the energy they need? Well, we do offer fresh fruit every morning. Um, and then we are also, it, it's challenging because part of the required components, which is in the slideshow, is a certain amount of grains at breakfast. Um, so we have a minimum portion that we do have to serve. So um, as nutrition professionals, we're constantly looking at labels, talking with industry, and trying to make better choices, um, as well as looking at labor time and what would be the choices for our staff to be able to prepare in time that would be a healthy option for our students. Um, and so, and continuously monitoring labels. My personal goal is to just do a little bit better than what they're asking, like I had mentioned with the added sugars. So knowing that we have three you know, or four years before we have to reach those goals, I wanna be there now. And so and I'm happy to say that we are. Does that answer your question? It does. I guess I am just looking at the experiences of my kids in the, in the food programs and some of the things that I was really sad to hear that, that they were eating at school. Uh, my kids love vegetables and on pizza day, was you know it was reported that they got one piece of broccoli on their tray um and i just would love to have more fresh fruits and more fresh vegetables i uh, i would also i'm just thinking about doing better than what uh the standards are I, my understanding is that the government is it's the standard that chocolate milk be served at schools for lunch uh, I don't know if that comes from anybody other than us, but I would love to see chocolate milk out of our cafeterias. I know a lot of kids who would drink milk even if it weren't chocolate and who don't need the milk and really don't need that added sugar. No, um, so chocolate milk isn't a required, but it is required we offer two different types of milk. And so that's kind of where the conundrum lies in that. Um, and then as far as the broccoli goes, I want to rewind because that's a sad thought to think that there was only one piece. The minimum portion is actually a half a cup of any vegetable that is served. And so whether that be a half a cup of fresh carrots or a half a cup of bro cooked broccoli, so that, I apologize, was a mishap that that had happened um, on your student's tray. Um, maybe the two types of milk we serve could be 2% and whole milk as opposed to white milk and chocolate milk. It has to be um, fat free or 1%. Oh, yeah. And that is, again, the USDA standard. Great. So fat free and 1% could be our two choices. It can be the choices when available. Yeah. So, um, Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, I have had the great fortune of working with Ms. Dell and Brian and the full and remarkable team um, taking care of our children's nutrition needs and feeding our community. And I just was so blown away by the work you did during the pandemic to support our community, really um, making 
something possible that seemed out of reach. And I'm just so impressed with the way you and the team have carried, moved forward um, into this post-pandemic phase of really holding those standards and um, making so much happen. It's, it's really remarkable. I've had a chance to sort of see it um, in the meetings and I just know that it is a tremendous amount of work and that we're not, that you're connecting with so many different aspects of it and with different organizations in the community um, and so many rock stars. It's just, it's really amazing to get to be a part of that um, and to see that work happening. And I also just want to congratulate you on the grants and not only dreaming big and setting lofty goals, but also pursuing them and taking action to, to meet those goals. It's, it's been such a pleasure to watch unfold. Um, and so thank you to you. Well, thank and you. And congratulations. The village. I'm grateful to be part of it. So thank you so much. I'm just curious, but still, if um, the relationship with Grow Foods also incorporates some of, I guess, what we're experiencing now with climate change and the flooding of the farms around us, and whether, I mean, I'm not putting that on you, but just wondering mm -hmm. if it's an opportunity, an educational opportunity, a teachable yeah. moment for us to talk with the, the students about this disaster that we've just experienced this this year, this it's summer. Absolutely devastating. Um, I was lucky to have the opportunity to be there at the farm just a few weeks ago and see the abundance of food and re realize that none of it was able to be consumed for different reasons, well, because of the flood. Um, but the conversations that we were having was including that topic of conversation with these field trips and with these educational programming that we're incorporating into the elementary school and the high school. Um, and even more so that they had discussed rearranging which classes would be coming for the field trips in the fall versus the spring to make a better impact on their ability to understand the flooding and the devastation. Great, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from Estelle? Yes, Member, Ma Member Miller. I think back to when I was in school and it was, you know, just pizza and um, tater tots. I think you're really doing an excellent job of expanding the diet for all of the children and making available to them some, even some fresh fruits and vegetables. That's amazing to me. I think you're doing a great job. Well, thank you. Kind. Any further comments from Estelle? No? Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So, Bobby, I know that you're on deck. Um, I'm wondering, we're trying to figure out how to accommodate the request to do um, at least one item of executive session now. Would you mind um, holding off for a bit? Is that okay? That's okay. fine, yeah. Okay, so what we are going to do, which is not what we usually do, is we are going to, um, Nam is going to send us to recess on their end, and we are going to go into executive session. We're going to stay here in the room. We're going to close all the doors. Nam is going to go to another part of the building, um, and um, we're going to put everyone who doesn't need to be the, in the executive session into a waiting room. And that way we can do this now without moving everyone over and then moving everyone back and then moving everyone over again, which will take a lot of time. Great. So we're going to give this a shot. Um, but to go into executive session, we need a motion. <laughs> Looks like you're ready. All right. Request to enter executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 30A, Section 20. A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the body, public body, and the chair so declares. Second. 
motion's been made and seconded. So we are going to go into executive session and we will then be coming back into open session. We will not be adjourning from executive session. So, um, um, thank I thank everyone for your patience while we do this and uh, for a few minutes as we figure out how to make this happen. But thank you, everyone. Um, and again, we will be coming back. So if you want to be here for the rest of the meeting, then hold on and we will uh, come back as soon as we're out of executive session. Thank you. Okay.
Recording in progress. All right, we are back. Thank you for anyone who waited. Sorry that took so long. Uh, so we're back in open session and we are on the agenda. We're under new business under B. Um, and uh, no, sorry, we're in reports and, re and recommendations under B. And back to Bobby. Ready for us, Bobby? Oh, hold on, Bobby has to unmute. There we go. Yeah. There. Okay. All right. Kaya, are you able to put that document up? Yes. I'll take some lessons. I just want to make sure I had it. Screen share. Let's see. We were just humming earlier. Such high hopes. That's um, what the process is going to be for this. Is Bobby going to go through all this, or are we just going to ask some specific questions? Portia, do you have the document I, that I also of the end of the year? I have it and a, as a PDF. Oh, oh, wait, it? I have it right here. Here we go. Sorry. She said, okay, if she sent it, I could pull it up. Yeah. Can mm -hmm. you? Um, did she just send it? I'm just wondering what an efficient way is. I Let's sent it to you a couple hours ago, but oh. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Probably down like Let me see. 50 uh, emails. Okay. Um, I, uh, yeah, it is about 50. Um, I have it. Bobby, yeah. I have it. I have it. I have it. Bobby, do you think you can give us just like a top line overview? Real quick. I can. I can be pretty fast and just kind of give you an overview of areas that were. Um, kind of large in their deficits. Great. That's exactly the question I would have. Yeah. Same. Okay. So if I'll, I'll take it by the sections between the blue bars on the left. Um, so we'll start with the, the school committee section. Um, there is one large uh, deficit of 10,594 and you'll all remember what that is, which is the MASD. Um, payment that we did, but bottom line is to the good of 1849. If you look down um, on the right hand side, you'll see the bottom of that section is to the good. So what what was that? that? Oh, yeah, sorry. My brain just caught up to what that was. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then the next section would be the superintendent office expense. And you'll see several larger um, deficits. So the first one being the superintendent. Um, and part of that was that they did do the NSIP program with um, Janelle. Um, so that was a big piece of that, along with some um, crossing over, I think, of um, previous uh, superintendents working with Janelle. Um, the previous, I shouldn't say. Anyway, Wait, so um, then the next, go ahead, sorry. So Bobby, on that one, so the, so it's 14,000 over for what? What, what, what was the 14,000 spent on? So the superintendent's contract I negotiated um, larger than what was budgeted for, and along with the, um, they allowed the NSIP program for her too, which is, quite a bit of money. But the essentially, it's probably the contract was settled for more than what the previous superintendent had. Budget. Budget. Mm -hmm. OK? Yeah. OK. Um, the next one down is the superintendent office support. And that was um, the executive secretary to the superintendent was hired at a higher amount um, than what was budgeted for for the previous person. 
um, in addition to the fact that the um, school committee clerk moved categories, which was approved by the school committee earlier. And then if you go down um, another line, you'll see the 17,454. That's in overtime or additional pay for the, um, the superintendent clerk additional. And that, as we know, is in regards to the um, additional time for minutes, um, as, as well as overtime due to lengthy meetings and, and whatnot, extending the work day. So that is that section. And those three items are the majority of what made up the deficit in that section of the 44 239. And Bobby, for the, the 23,803, is that just a reflection of the change in salary? That is, yes. Yeah. Thanks. For two, for two people, though. Right. OK. All right, and the next section is the <coughs> district admin. You'll just see that's really a wash. That second line should have been paid out of the first line, but that section is to the good. Um, move on to page two. Um, the business and finance section, um, look at the bottom. What I'll point you out to is look at the actual bottom. There you go. And. Um, that's kind of what I'm going to go through for the theme. So that's that was to the good. So there was no problems there. Um, about the, the legal one. Oh, I was just saying yeah. we know about the legal one. We've talked about it before. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Legal one, we're we're good with. Everybody knows that. Um, the next on um, two, that one. If you go back to page three, you'll see that's to the good. So there's no problems there. Bobby, just one quick question on the legal one. That's just the fees to Layla, right? That doesn't include settlement money? Or is the settlement money in there too? No, well, there's only one settlement payment and that is not in that fee. Okay. But that does include not only just um, Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn, it's also um, the investigator. Uh, that, yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And we're separating out the special ed legal costs from this? That's correct. That's that's a separate line. You'll see that the next line down that's the um, comes out to zero. Right there, yeah. Whoever's doing the cursor is doing lots. <laughs> um so yep, yeah, so that's separate and that came out okay. It was, but I, no, no, no. I was Meg. <laughs> Okay, so I think now we're on to the curriculum expenditures, um, which came out good. There's no problems there. Moving on to department heads, um, no problems there. We'll go on to page four, um, which is actually going to continue into page five. And if you see at the bottom line, it's overspent by 6000 um, but if you look at the fourth line down on the right, you'll see the 57,296. Um, so what that is, is the hiring of a new principal for the high school. It's also um, paying the two people who supported his absence, or not his, but mm -hmm. the previous person's absence. <clears throat> so that's a big part of that. Um, then we'll go on to page six, which continues to page seven. Again, looking at the bottom line, you'll see that that came out um, good. Just, I would say that I just want you to pay attention to that line when you get to the subs because you'll see that the subs is going to be way overspent, but in part because it was coverage for some of the absences that people were getting paid. Um, but this line actually covers that. Then on to the medical therapeutic services, which goes from page seven into page eight. Um, and that is um, 
overspent by quite a bit, the 248. And what that entails is that there was some um, contract services that we had to pay for site um, services when we didn't have a psychologist on hire. Um, and if you look, when we get further down, you'll see that there's some monies left in the psychologist line. Not that much, but there is some. And then in addition to that, for the therapeutic services, um, the, just the needs of the students have, has changed immensely. So that's what that piece is. Um, then we get down to um, the substitute line, which is the 200,000. And again, if you look back to the teacher's line, there's money left in that line, um, which some of these things are covering for those absences there. And, and Bobby, can I just ask you one question on the medical therapeutic thing? Yep. Um, if I understood it correctly, the way we changed um, having the internship program to do some of that work, those students that are the graduate students, right? And then is the other MOA about allowing school psychologists to perform at their discretion additional work ways to curb that cost this year? That is a piece of that. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to move to paraprofessionals and aides, which will continue from page eight into page nine. Um, and that again is a, is a large thing. What that is, is um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there were additional stipends that um, weren't budgeted for when the contract settled. Um, it's all overtime for um, ESPs, not well, overtime for anything that they do, but also additional work. And if they're in the building alone um, on a regular school day without the administrative assistant with them. Um, and then um, I guess that's it, the, the subs the ESP additional pay and the stipends. Bobby, can so I ask you to pause for a second? Do you want to do the sure. honors mm -hmm. since you're on your way out the door? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can move to extend. Oh, suspend. suspend. Oh, look, look at her. She's <laughs> Sorry, what did I say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll move to Second suspend time. the rules indefinitely because Save us the vote. Is there a second? Second. second. By Member Levy, seconded by Member Agna. Uh, any discussion? Roll call, please. Mm. Member Davis? Yes. Mayor Shara? Yes. Member Robbins? I guess so. <laughs> Member Gazy? Yes. Member Serafie Cox? Yes, but only if Dina calls in from her car while she's driving home. <laughs> 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 Member Stein? Yes. Member Levy? No. No. <laughs> uh, member Miller? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. And Member Agna? Yes. Okay. Uh, continue, Bobby. Thank you. Okay. So moving forward into the media center section, which is your librarian. Um, if you go on to page 10, you'll see that's to the good. Um, then down into your tech integration specialist, that line is also to the good. Um, page 10 going into 11, which is the professional development, um, that ended up to the good. Um, we'll skip the outside professional development of 35 cents over spent. Um, textbooks is good. Uh, instructional materials continues on to page 12. That's all to the good. Um, instructional equipment, which is our copy release, is to the good. And just to note, that is one of the sections that we did um, reduce with the budget costs due to a new contract um, with the copier people. Um, the next general supplies is overspent by 6262 um, which is really covered by monies that were left in instructional supplies, but we have to separate it out for um, end of year DESI reporting requirements. 
on page 12 from the other instructional into page 13. Um, looking at the bottom line, that turned out okay. Um, instructional hardware was okay. Um, other instructional hardware, again, that's a DESI reporting requirement. So while that was overspent by 2000, there was money left in the line above. Um, instructional software, page 13 going into 14. Um, there was monies left there. Um, the guidance social work section, monies left there. Testing and assessments, money left there. Um, okay, and that's that. Okay, and then on to um, 14, which goes into 15 for the psychologist. I had pointed out earlier, that's a piece of us from a previous line having to contract out because we didn't have a psychologist on board. Um, then the next section, which is attendance, and that was that's really a portion of three different salaries, and there's percentages that are between different lines. So I think it's just a shift in what actual percentage there was um, given to each line. Medical health services, that's over by 10,000. Um, the big part of that is looking at the second line down, the director of health services. Um, that position was hired at a higher um, salary than the, the exiting director of health services. So now on to page 16, we have transportation. Um, that's overspent by 11,000. A big piece of that is um, about half of the way down, you'll see 70,436. That's foster care and transportation. Um, and that's something we don't have a lot of control of. So um, we do get some reimbursement for that. Um, but all together, that's not too, too bad. Next uh, line is the food service section. You'll see that's all left. We did not use any portion of that. Um, and again, that is one of the areas that we reduced um, going into this current year, the FY24 budget. Um, with the advent of the free lunches, we're gonna keep a good eye on it, but that's something that, you know, they're in good standing. They're finally a program that is actually running as it was meant to be, which is self-sufficient. Um, 16, or on the end of 16 is the athletic department, it goes into 17, and that ends up in a good place. Um, the next section is student activities, which is overspent by 10,000. Um, that, in the future, we're gonna need to increase um, because it probably hasn't caught up with the various contract um, increases. So that's gonna have to be increased down the road, but for now, that wasn't terrible either. Um, school security, that was um, nothing spent there. Then 17 into 18 is your custodials. Um, expenses, and you'll see a lot of various little, um, you know, deficits, but again, draw your attention to the bottom of that section, which was to the good by 93,000. Um, our gas line, the natural gas was over by 5,000. Um, that's not horrible. Uh, utilities, the next part is 18 into 19, and that is over by 39,914. Um, I would draw your attention about a third of the way down. You'll see that the net metering fee, we're in a deficit of 108. Um, what I think that is, and I have to do some more investigation, but I think that would be um, addition of all the three elementaries, there's one that doesn't have the solar, um, but those fees increased. There was some savings in the electric lines, not that much, doesn't cover that. Um, but 
but that needs to be looked into but overall within that section it was only overspent by thirty nine thousand um, next section is grounds um, that's overspent by almost seventeen thousand and the majority of that was that there was some tree work that needed to be done at two of our elementary schools. And so that's gonna happen year to year based, you know, not necessarily uh, just a tree service, but in certain areas of maintenance, you're gonna have to have, like roofing is gonna be one year, maybe different than the next year. So it's just one of those situations. Um, oh, Bobby. On the maintenance of grounds, do you know if that's where, like, the, it's going to come up for a later update, but do you know if that's where the money for, um, like, the athletic fields is as well? Is that considered grounds, or is that somewhere else? Or is that in athletics? That is the, that's the grounds, yeah. Grounds. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then you have maintenance of buildings, which goes into 20, and then again to 21. And you'll see that came out okay. Um, the maintenance of equipment, that came out okay at the bottom line. Same with your extraordinary <coughs> maintenance. Um, and then your um, tech maintenance salaries, which goes 21 into 22, came out good. Um, tech maintenance expenses, that again is in a good place. And then you'll see the separation costs. And this is where um, that's overspent by 32. What that was is um, vacation buyback for the exiting Northampton High School principal, um, Lori. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also the JFK um, principal who had resigned and had vacation time left that he had to be paid out. Um, and then unemployment is a case by case. So that went way over. Um, but that's kind of hard to judge. It just depends. Um, that's something for FY25. We're going to have to look at increasing that line. Um, so that's something we're going to have to pay attention to, that particular line. Um, and then uh, 22 into 23 is our insurance, our liability, which was on 22, um, was overspent by 9,000. And we'll probably have to increase <coughs> that line in the future, but that's dependent on what we had for claims. Um, then we go, the rest of that page is all to the good, as well as to um, the last page. So you'll see at the very end, we came out to a zero balance. Um, and we were able to put only um, 193,643. But we did do a transfer of that um, into the, our school choice account. And I will bring you, just so you know, um, in October, I'll bring the school choice up. So did I miss it, Bobby, or did you talk about the uh, negative 213K under non-public tuition, the out-of-district? Mm, where did you see that? Yeah, it's on 22. I think I'm missing what you're saying. Sorry. Page 22, 9,300, non-public tuition. Non-public tuition on page, am I looking at something different here? Are you looking at, is it, uh, no, they're the same page right now. I'm looking at year to date, year to date August PDF. That's my copy of this. Oh, and I followed along. June. June. Yeah. Do you have a page 22 on yours? This page 22. I do. Mine on public tuition is on page 24, and that's to the good. Oh, I see where you're going. So, yeah. so my numbering's different because it's a PDF. Yeah. 
but what is the negative 213? Yeah, your page is 24. Okay. Uh, Bobby, your, Bobby, your page is 20, is it 24, is it 24 for this? I think. 24. My non-public is on the last page. But why does it say, here it says August thing? Yeah. Oh, you know what? You're looking at 2024 um, document. This is the end of the year, end of that. Let me just see if she's year. got that. So it says like year to date dash June at the top. There's another document. It's the one that I don't wonder. It does say year to date, Dan, but I have year to date August. So what's up with that? I have that same document. It's the fiscal once, year. Once year to date, once end of year. There's oh, two financial yeah. documents. It says year to date. You're August, looking though. at 2024. Yeah. You want the 2023. Right. You want to look at what we want the end of year. Two documents. Why would I have the year to date 2024, though? Because that's our current year. Because right. that's, a, that's, that's the monthly report yeah, now. as opposed to the end of year report. Yes. We were looking at the, yeah. the end of year. Right. We've been looking at the end of the year report. And so right. this is another report. This is okay. the current year. Okay. So we haven't gotten to that one yet. Okay. That would right. be the I was following it through both pages. And that was my big question okay. was about that negative dot. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Emily, sorry, member Cox. Yeah, sorry. It's okay. It, it was a little <laughs> yeah, alarming. Okay. It was, yeah. Um, uh, Bobby, you said uh, the amount that were that you were able to transfer into the uh, school choice account. Can you remind the committee how much we were, as it were, relying on um, in order to balance the FY24 budget? Right, we are not relying on that because the mayor did come up with that $1.2 million, but if we had been, I would have been in trouble because I was gonna hope for 600. Um, <laughs> but given the um, legal line alone, and then um, some of the other lines that wouldn't have been feasible. Bobby, so, do, you have, do you have any estimate about tailings? Any tailings that might be left from that? That that is the tailing, the one ninety three six forty three. That's the total. Okay. Right. Yeah. So then that's what was put back into the put back in. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which I will bring you in October the update of that. And then just to, if I can respond to um, Meg's question about the deficit in the um, line on the August year to date, which is uh, 213, 192. So what that will be is that we'll shift some of that into the circuit breaker. Why do that we, just hasn't been Why do we yet. have it? Why do we have the deficit? Of 213, yeah. So your total special ed expenses are more than what we budget for because we also have circuit breaker funds that we use. So the, the encumbrances that are in there right now are all put into the general fund, which some of them will have to be moved into um, the circuit breaker piece. And then additionally, we used 400 in right. um, ESSER, ESSER funds for, so that that's a part of that as well. So this is an anticipated expense? This, this negative number yeah. will not be negative in the budget once we make the appropriate moves. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're sure of that. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. Okay. So, just on that same point too, and we talked a little bit about this at budget and property, the circuit breaker is another one of these things that we don't see. So mm -hmm. when we get into the budget process again, it would be great if we can get a special education portion that includes the expended costs and then what we think we're getting back from the circuit breaker and then which portion is actually in the budget. Because yep, without right. that, when you look at this, you're like, it looks like we have a massive overage we didn't plan for. Which is not the case, right, yeah. But we don't know yet what we're getting back specifically on the circuit breaker yet. Well, for circuit breaker, we do because what we plan on using, we Last use year. the year before, right? right. Okay. And then, um, and so that will be part of our um, process for the FY25 budget. 
um, you'll definitely be seeing all the grants and how we um, use those for the um, budget. You'll see the revolving funds. You will see everything um, for FY25. So thank you. It'll be much clearer this year. Bobby, thank you so much for including this year-end actuals report and running through it with us today. I really appreciate that. It's a nice way to set us up moving into the next season. Thank you, Bobby. Any other questions on the year end? No. Um, okay. So we got a preview of the monthly. Do you want to, anything you want to highlight about that? Uh, for the regular monthly? No, I'll do that in September because that'll give us a full quarter. I mean, October rather. So that'll give us a full quarter to the end of September. So then okay. I can review um, okay, we, you already talked about the warrants. Uh, did you talk about the personnel report? I can't recall. No, I don't usually talk about that. Okay. There's so many changes, there's so many shifts, but. Mm -hmm. Bobby, in the person, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, go. In the personnel report, you mentioned, there's a couple that are highlighted in the new hires. Is there, or bolded, I mean, is there any reason why those are bold? I don't put that report together. Yeah, okay. Um, so I then I won't worry about it. Thank you. No? Yeah. I don't think so. Okay. I don't see it. And they're not highlighted on my page. So I don't I don't think there is any reason. Other than maybe at one point we were waiting for information um, to fill in so we highlighted it and then um, when the information came in we didn't unhighlight that could very well be. Okay. Um, and do you have your report, the business administrator report, or are you all set? No, I'm good. Okay. I talked about that before we went into executive session. Okay, great. Um, so I'm set. Excellent. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate it. Sorry to make you wait in purgatory for so long. Okay. <laughs> oh. Apologize. Um, I'm used to that. <laughs> oh. Oh. Um, okay, so moving on to rules and policy. Holly, uh, Member Gazy. Uh, hello. So, um, just a, I'm not bringing you any uh, thing for first or second readings with just a quick update. Uh, the BEDB agenda format. Uh, uh, Dr. Bonner wanted to get the okay to move new business up and we pointed out that that ability was already in the thing. Um, we did notice while we were talking about BEDB that it had not yet been posted to the website and so um, Dr. Bonner created a spreadsheet which we I filled out that keeps track of all our policies, first readings, second readings, when they're in rules and policy, any notes and attaching documents, which should, and then when they're posted, which should give us a much better um, oversight of the whole process so we don't drop any things. Uh, with regard to the um, se sexual prophylactics, uh, thing. We forwarded to Attorney Tyler the um, member Robbins's um, research that she had done on all the districts that had um, put this policy in place and all the legal precedents that they had for um, uh, for making these available to seventh and eighth graders. Um, we, Dr. Bonner is still in the process of checking with the nurses and so that's another in process thing. Um, we did review the protocols for contacting the attorney um, either through 
uh, by school committee members, either going through the superintendent or the chair is another viable alternative. Um, mostly Dr. Bonner wants to know because she can be sure the billing is correct. Um, we discussed whether we need a formal policy or to put it in the norms or just have it be a part of understood practices. Uh, and member Serfi Cox uh, suggested putting it in the school committee handbook and norms that um, member Goldman worked on. And she's, member Serfi Cox is drafting language to that point. Uh, we talked about policy JRA, which is the student records. We noticed that the MASC policy is far simpler than ours because they just summarize it, um, whereas our policy is taken directly from the law and MASC says that schools will follow the law. Um, our policy does have a helpful outline for administrators about problems with non that might arise, for example, with non-custodial parents. And again, that is in consultation with Attorney Taylor. So that's where we are, uh, short and sweet. Excellent, thank you. Any questions? Nope, okay. Um, thank you, Member Gazy. Moving on to budget and property. Member Goldman? Actually, I'm thank gonna... you. I'm going to take oh, it. Right? Yeah. Member Agnes? <laughs> I'm just going to say, we just had our meeting um, earlier this week, and we did um, discuss the grounds topic, which Gwen is the lead on, so I'll let her uh, say her be piece brief. about that. Be brief. I will be brief. Thank and, you. And there is the pesticides application on school property document in the folder, which is the good reminder that we have until December of 2024 to implement the period of um, where there will be no application of pesticides on the grounds, playing fields, and playgrounds. We did have, I did speak with Tony Kuzniers, and he also came to the Budget and Property Committee meeting. It's, it appears that that hasn't moved on in a way that we are um, happy about. So we are going to continue to talk with Tony and talk with the grounds people about how we're going to make sure that we do get to that point before December 2024. And Dr. Bonner and I have an appointment with maintenance, the grounds people to have um, an on-site tour and an understanding of what the issues are. But that being said, we do understand the obligation and we're going to be making sure that there's a plan in place for that to happen. Great, thanks. Any Thanks so much, Gwen, for your uh, leadership on this Thank you. issue. And our next meeting is actually after, the Monday after our next school committee meeting. So we won't have an update at the next meeting. Thank okay. you. Um, just real quickly, and this excellent summary from Member Agna and Member Goldman. Just I, one thing I learned in the meeting that I think we all were surprised about was um, two budgets ago, we were asked to cut the cost to implement the program. And we f found out in the meeting that that year, some of it was implemented. So it was this weird moment in which we thought we had made a cut, and yet there was money that was spent it was just one of these moments where you're like, I don't know the, the, the reality between what we pass and the decisions we're presented and what we make versus what actually happened was really different. And that was, that was concerning. Um, I don't know what to do with it, but I just wanted to share that with everybody else here um, um, to think about as we go into the next, next fiscal session. Um, curriculum subcommittee, Member Robbins. Um, we met for the first time of this academic year quickly. Um, it was a delight to have Dr. Bonner join us. She was up on it. She had 
spread the mission. She had great suggestions to make about implementing pieces of it, some of which we will address in our strategic retreat, whatever its name is. Um, we will, um, the high school will begin to really look at collecting data on embedded honors, but the suggestion was made, I think we mentioned this last time, that we will be looking at data across the school um, to look at student performance data, not just in embedded honors, and looking at the data sets that that informs, that we can be informed by, um, including how traditionally marginalized students are doing. Um, we talked about some antiquated software, what some changes have been done to open that up, and some new purchase, purchases that will help different pieces of software speak to each other, the update on Parent Square, um, and uh, the start time, Dr. Bonner will go to the alt to gather data from administrators and teachers, and we'll be looking at pre-COVID and post-COVID attendance and tardiness, and we'll focus on getting a survey out this fall for <coughs> administrators and teachers. Um, we quickly looked at um, the other stuff that would be of key interest to you would be that we had a really detailed report from um, Curriculum Director Dory about the <coughs> math and ELA rollouts, and she gave us a very good interview and over. She's going to give it to us in October because we have nothing else to do in that meeting. But um, yeah, we <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, but it was really good, and we thought that um, constituents would really like to see this. Um, it's really good, crystal clear data on what that those monies spent look like in terms of how kids are learning and how teachers are implementing it in their classrooms. And our next meeting is Wednesday, October 4th. Great. Any questions or comments? Member Roberts? Okay. Seeing none, then Member Miller. Do you have a report? Um, so I would say that I have not had, um, we have not continued with monthly meetings because since Dr. Bonner is now here, um, she is meeting with um, the clerk every week. And um, so, as you all know, um, there have been hires to help with this. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that also some of the minutes that we revise or that we edit may have not been done by Annie, but may have been done by one of these helpers, basically. Um, and so um, I don't really have much else to report. Great, okay, thank you. Um, any discussion topics? No. Um, okay, future business. Some of you have said these already, but I'll go through them quickly. Budget and property subcommittee, 4.30 on Monday. That's the past. Okay. Um, school committee retreat, 6.30 p.m. in the uh, collaborative boardroom on September 18th, um, and that's beginning discussion of strategic planning. Rules and policy subcommittee, 4 p.m. Wednesday, September 20th. Superintendent evaluation subcommittee, 6.30. Monday, October 2nd, Curriculum Subcommittee, 5 p.m. Wednesday, October 4th, School Committee with Student Advisory Council, which starts at 6 p.m. on Thursday, October 12th, Budget and Property, 4.30 on Monday, October 16th, and Rules and Policy, 4.30, Wednesday, October 18th. And we have covered the executive session, so I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion to so adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure who. Uh, it was me. Member, okay. Gaze. Member Gazy made the motion. It was seconded by who? Who was that? Emily? Gaze. Member Sarvi Cox or was it Member Goldman? Someone pipe up. I'll second it. Second goes it to. not me. Okay, second goes to Member Agna. Yes. Um, roll call, please, on adjourning. Mayor Shara. Yes. Member Robbins. Yes. Member Gazy. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Levy is not with us. Uh, Member Miller. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. And Member Davis. Yes. All right, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nam. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.